Hi, Riley. Hi. Hi, Heather. <laughs> um, it's nice to see you. So uh, one of the things that I've noticed about your practice um, is the way that it seems to really um, encompass a sense of contemplative and active observation in the world. Um, you talk a lot about watching the body and watching the mind um, and observing the way that these movements in the body and the mind um, influence one another. And I think that's just so amazing because it allows a connection to be made that should be natural, but most of the time isn't because um, it seems like it's easier to inhabit one plane over another sometimes. Um, so in terms of the act of observation as a root into your practice, a dance practice or a movement practice, um, the way that you teach your classes and interact with the other dancers that you work with. Could you talk a little bit about that? Talk a little bit about the intentionality behind the act of observation and the act of making this connection between the mind and the body? Yeah, um, you know, um, dance is a practice that involves your full self. It involves your full, you know, your full body. Um, and in, in saying that, uh, I think it also involves your mind as much as your body. Um, I think there's a real difference between the concept of your brain as an organ versus what your mind is. Um, and and through, through, you know, years of dance training and ballet and then improvisation and the choreography that we're making now, um, I think it's important to both of us that it's not just about the movements that we're doing or the steps that we're doing or the way that they look visually or even are organized in a, in a performance space or a classroom, but that while you're moving, you've also um, got a sense that you're moving your state of mind as much as your body. Um, and that's one of the things that keeps me doing what I'm doing because it's, it's, it's interesting because the mind is so complex and it, 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 basically using, using your body and using movement and using dance to explore your mind um, and then to figure out how to put that into a performative setting where that's actually what the choreography is, is that you know, we're, we're, we're dancing minds and then also uh, facilitating a space, a performance space where people are going to be watching that um, is, is something that has a, a, a lot of complexity to it and a lot of mystery to it and it changes every day, you know, the way that you feel one day in the beginning of class or one performance, it, it's, it, that feels distinctly what that is that day, and then the next day it feels like something else. So it's this sense of like impermanence that everything is yeah. always moving, everything is always changing. Well, and then you bring up an interesting point too, which is that the audience also has a role in observation, of course, which is not something I had thought of before. Um, so that's interesting to think about, like what is that sort of external observation of the observing self, you know, what does that look like? Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to speak? Yeah, um, one thing that I feel like both Riley and I bring up quite a bit when we're teaching and working with other people is that, um, like this idea that the mind is everywhere and that like what, like what Riley was saying, how there's a difference between like the brain as an organ and like the mind is actually something that for some reason we think about it just existing in our, our headspace or up here, but um, that we're really interested in like figuring out how we can drop out of that space a little bit and go into like the mind as it like wanders in and out of the body. Um, Intuitive. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, like the, the transformation process that you undergo when you're in that place, like how you notice at the beginning of either class or practice or a rehearsal, how you feel differently than you do even like 20 minutes into it or by the end of it and sort of, um, yeah, taking, like taking the time and the patience to sit with, to sit with yourself and to sit with your body and your mind and allowing for that patience to create space for a transformation to take place. Yeah, yeah. that's really interesting too to think about like what the, what the line is between something that's intuitive and something that's contemplative. Like, are they distinct? Are they intrinsically related and the same? Um, and I would love to hear um, from either of you about how what you're talking about is related to the authentic movement practice 
that you're interested in? Yeah, yeah. authentic movement practice. Well, it's it's something that I discovered in its in its sort of distinct form, like fairly recently, but that I discovered was really related to a lot of the things that I had been working on or been a part of through um, through my through my career uh, as a as a performing improviser with um, with William Forsyth. Um, that's not something we worked on, you know, in the company when I was living in, in Germany, but. Um, it's uh, authentic movement practice is a you know it's it, it was it was a, a, a actually a form of dance therapy that was created by Mary Starks Whitehouse in the 1950s. She was a, a Martha Graham trained dancer um, and it was also a Jungian psychoanalyst. And so she sort of combined these two um, ex experiences or you know uh, sets of knowledge that she had about like this this is what psychology is at this point and and also this is what the body is. And so it was a form of dance therapy where she would invite people into, you know, movement space um, in a very supportive way, where instead of doing, you know, what I think of as like logic-based movement, where you're trying to achieve a task, where like I'm, I'm making an improvisation with the form of ballet, and there's sort of a prescribed way that it looks within the form that we know is embedded in the body and historically sort of set already. Instead of that, it's it's like you go you go into the dance space and you close your eyes and you you wait to be moved instead of deciding what you're supposed to be doing and move it that way, um, and so that it it it, it offers a an op a space to pay attention to what you're thinking about when you're moving, um, what memories you have, what emotions you have, um, all the sort of layers of cognition that happen all the time in us that we don't usually pay attention to or give a lot of space to, you know? Yeah. I think of it a lot like, you know, our conscious, our sort of outer conscious layer and then the sort of subconscious layer, uh, layer in that sort of Jungian way um, is, is bridged by the movement. Yeah. So that's when we're, when you're allowing yourself to move intuitively or in this contemplative way and whatever that sort of means, um, it's, it feels almost like you're, you're, like bringing something up, yeah. you know, you're you're bringing it up from a from a place that that doesn't usually have a, you know, a, a doesn't usually have a place because it's 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 there, but it's not it's not what's sort of usually uh, directing you in yeah. terms of how you move. Yeah, and I think that um, this idea of like not needing to get anywhere in particular is really important, and I think that's something that we're both working on not only in teaching and in our class, but also in process and making work that um, going into it without sort of like an idea of it, like, oh, it has to be this one thing or it has to look like this one thing because something is gonna happen. Like if we like, if Riley and I go into the studio and just like start working with each other or start doing something, like eventually something will happen. So we don't need to like, force it to look like anything in particular. Just like be in the moment. You yeah. Know? Like, like it, you know, every day you feel a little bit different and, and you go into the room with what you have and you're not anybody else than who you are that day. And when you're moving your, your whole body and letting the intuition go, like you realize how, how much you're actually working with, like how much is down there, like how much of your personal and inherited biography you have that's like, that's actually what you're moving. Yeah. You know, or, or being moved by. Well, and then letting yourself watch that yeah, in the sort of like it, yeah. observational sense that I was mentioning before. I think that that is where this like, you know, very quick transformation can happen. You know, having taken a class from each of you without having any dance background at all and essentially never considering my body and daily life and never thinking about it. Um, you know, I was really impressed by how immediate that process was. There is, you know, there is no moment between, you know, the state of not having that connection and not making that observation and being completely deeply into it just, you know, because of the way it was presented. So I think that's, that's amazing how it kind of transcends training and it transcends um, any kind of didactic relationship you may have to, um, you know, the field that you've been educated in. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, dancer or non-dancer, everybody has a body, so everybody right. has yeah. something. <laughs> right. Like, if you close your eyes and enter into that space, everyone has something in there to notice. Yeah, so, and like, how yeah. many times do people, throughout their day, do you really think about your back? That's not a thing that people usually think about. Like, you know, all of our perceptive architecture is facing front and side. Like, we don't we don't often think about the backs of our body, and so, but you do have it, it's there, and it's, it's, it's also practice of, 
you know, through moving, you, you feel it happen, you have this sort of uh, kinesthetic awareness, your, your proprioceptive muscles right, yeah. get flexed and get, you know, get, get uh, developed through, through dance practice in a way that um, is always surprising. Well, and it's nice not to have to rely on pain to cause you to make the association. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. In my experience, it's yeah. more like, oh, I noticed this because it, there's something wrong with it, right? This yeah. is just more of a holistic way of recognizing, you know, the mechanism of, you know, the mind as maybe something that is intellectual and emotional, and then the body as something that is connected but distinct. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you uh, a little bit more about your um, your own formal practices. Um, you're both part of Little House Dance, and you're very connected in that way. Um, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how your own histories and practices are distinct from each other, um, and you know what you can tell us about you know what you're bringing specifically as individuals. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so my, most of my professional background is in choreography and in writing. And um, I did, you know, some professional performing, but not in the type of company context that, um, that Riley was in. And so I feel like the, the sort of angle that I am bringing to the work that we're doing is really formed and has really grown out of the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years. Um, working collaboratively with other artists in order to make work and um, you know sometimes those collaborations have been things that have been really driven by me and then sometimes they've been collaborative work that's been driven by someone else and I feel like that's where a lot of my like that's kind of where my experience and training has come out of and um, certainly like Riley is very interested in working collaboratively and we've sort of found a way that um, the different things that we're interested in and exploring that we're able to to bring together and work on. Yeah, um, I yeah, I'm, I'm I'm classically trained. I started training in ballet and in, in Bangor um, and when I was a kid, and then really was on the on a track of I would say ballet into sort of contemporary ballet into modern dance, and um, I. I, I Went to the Walnut Hill School for high school, it was an arts, arts boarding high school, and then I went to Juilliard for college. And um, Juilliard's a very intense school, and it's it, at that time especially it was really, really geared towards uh, training, training dancers to be professional, um, professional artists in, in, in dance companies. So I went to Europe for about ten years and danced in a couple different uh, companies around there, sort of contemporary dance companies. Um, most of my most, most of my performance career has been with a choreographer named William Forsyth um, in Frankfurt, Germany. I worked with him for about 12 years, um, and you know, for really, you know, for, uh, until until now, I mean, I, I I haven't primarily thought of myself as a choreographer. I've been calling myself more of a dance artist because I find that 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 term has allowed me to bring in other areas of, of art practices that are deeply informed by dancing and by choreographic thinking, but I just wasn't really ready to, you know, do, do you know, sort of what Heather's been doing about, like, I'm really focusing on making a dance in a performative setting. Although, I, you know, I have, but it wasn't my primary focus. And so now, um, you know, I moved back to Maine uh, about six, you know, six years ago or so, and in that period, I was doing a lot of other you know practices with music and sculpture and video art and teaching improvisation and teaching contemplative dance um, and really through this commission and through meeting Heather and working with her I've, I've been able to um, synthesize a lot of those different practices back into what feels very familiar of, of a, a dance performance setting somehow. That's interesting it's really it's so cool to hear how you're both coming from this immersion in your disciplines from different perspectives and I love how you know that kind of surfaces and connects but also it allows you to maintain what's distinct about your own approach and your own voice. Yeah. It's beautiful, it's, com that. it's yeah. complex you know to have people in the space with you yeah. and it's like it's not just about you yeah. anymore but it's about like what you bring together is, is what you make together is so much so much greater so much bigger than than anything that you could do by yourself. Right. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. surprising and interesting and it pushes you and it's yeah. yeah. And it's also not about forming yourself to a disciplinary standard in a, right. in a right. sense. Yeah it's something that I've found 
that has been kind of like a little bit of a joke between us, but has been really fun is that um, when I first started working with Riley like a year ago, I wasn't like dancing in the work. I was really like on the outside in my like choreographic zo compositional zone. And um, Riley really like pulled me in and now I'm performing in the work and... Um, yeah, she didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had no plans. Oh, really? I had no plans to perform like that at is all. So funny. Um, I didn't know that. No, it was not. It was not something that I was planning to do. Um, but the way that we've been working collaboratively, it's made sense. And um, mm -hmm. I think there's been something really that for me has been really great about this process of coming back into um, who I am as a performer and starting to to think about it and then being able to think about that now after having spent you know the better part of the last 10 years really focusing on making my own work to now be sort of bringing what I learned from that into my approach as being a performer in a work that um, Riley is directing. And um, yeah, how I think it's kind of cool that Riley in high school, he was telling me he identified as a choreographer and then kind of put that aside for a little bit or not put it aside, but was just focused on other things. And now he's returning to something else. So. Yeah, it's been interesting how we've both had these different paths that have gone like this way, but we've kind of like, yeah, we've kind of like come back to things that were familiar to us or more familiar to us maybe when we were younger. And That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's like a shift of perspective too. I think I think shifting perspective is so important as an artist. Like I think one of the reasons why I, I really craved to do other things besides choreograph or be only, only primarily a performer was that it's what I've done since I was 10 years old. That, like that's that's really my main identity is like Riley is a dancer, and that, that's what I've done, and those, that hasn't changed. But um, but then when I started to do this practice or that practice or that sculpture or this video or whatever, it, it it's like all of them feel like I'm talking about the same thing, but I'm just moving a little bit to this angle and then looking at this these sort of base base values or base you know baseline ideas that I've been growing you know in in, in curious ways for, for many many years um, and I just think that's really valuable because if you don't if you don't you know it's like if you're just looking at one thing or one idea from one perspective and you don't you don't shift yourself relative to it then you only see it from one angle you only see it from one perspective and so then you can do that on your own in your practice and then you can also do it with other people, you know, as your environment, and like, people change you, you know? Yeah. We very yeah, much, like, choreograph each yeah. other in a way, um, in, in ways that you wouldn't do if you were just by yourself in a room. And, like, dance is a social art, so it happens because people are dancing together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, too, to me, as an outside observer of your work together, how you both seem to inhabit these totally different physical presences as dancers. Like, you seem to yeah. inhabit this, like, absolutely never-ending like fluid <laughs> movement of this kind of like golden liquid that's just like curving through space yeah, and Heather right. I feel like you have you inhabit the most kind of like energetic stillness that is like so <laughs> full of like you know like potential dynamism but um is very carefully calibrated and it's just to me it's wonderful to see those things together as these kind of like abstract psychic elements that respond to each other. You know? They were very different, you know. Yeah, like I, I, I tend that. to be I move very fast, I talk fast, I think that like everything I'm more, <laughs> dramatic, I'm more unpredictable. <laughs> Heather's so measured and she's like she has a, a real grounding quality which is helpful for me. But, but, but it's been nice to bring those qualities out in each other. Like I feel like in some ways you know, Riley has like kind of like gotten me going on certain things and like he's able to um, energize me and like move me forward in ways that are like not just physical but in other ways too and um, how, you know, I like to offer like some things to help bring Riley back down to earth sometimes and so yeah. yeah yeah I think it's been um I mean I've been having a lot of fun like learning those it's things so, it's so fun learning it's just and then it comes out it's it's just fun it's fun and we yeah. just enjoy working with each other so much and like it's you know if you're not loving it what you're doing then there's no point what are you doing right, yeah. you know it's like, well and it's nice to see how the expression of it is um coming together in the piece that you're working on mm -hmm. Our Wolf in the Lighthouse um which will be you know it'll be so exciting as a kind of a performance that's open to the community to come watch, something that's like really opening up the space of the mechanics hall and the sensibility of um, your work together. So I'm really curious about that, that piece. Um, I'm curious about the narrative structure of the, 
Our Wolf in the Lighthouse piece um, and how the narrative or, um, you know, the kind of uh, more sort of direct background is taking form in a more abstract or conceptual way in the piece. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about the form of the piece, but also the background of the piece. Um, and Heather, if you could also talk a little bit about your experience kind of leading into the creation of this, um, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so this project came about, I, I feel like it was like a kind of a perfect storm of like a lot of things that came together to make this work possible. Um, but Riley and I started working about a year and a half ago and um, a, about a year and a half prior to when we started working, my um, best friend and creative collaborator and composer had died by suicide. Um, and I had worked with him, his name was Mark, Mark Bartizal. We worked together for about 10 years. And he was with me like through my whole creative practice, like from the time I was in school and um, scored all of the professional work that I had done. And, so, I mean, my plan was like, I was gonna work with this person for the rest of my life. Um, and he, yeah, he, he died, he died by suicide. And it was something that really kind of like threw me um, and came like out of left field was not something at the time that I was expecting. Although in retrospect, it's um, easy to kind of like start to see, see things, like see how things ended up the way that they did. Um, and b before he had died, I was dealing with a lot of my own struggles with um, uh, mental illness. I li live with major depression and suicidal ideation, which I've experienced, you know, from the time I was young. And so his death really opened up this like uh, huge space in my life and in, in my world where I was kind of forced to reconcile and like look at a lot of these things that I was dealing with and struggling with. Um, and after he died, I was pretty sure that I was not going to make work again, or at least I wasn't going to make it in the way that I was um, before. And so I had taken a really long break and was sort of like reevaluating everything. Um, and then the pandemic happened. And like in a lot of ways for me, the pandemic was kind of a blessing because um, it was the first time that I didn't feel the sort of like pressure to have this like forward motion yeah. with my career and to be like doing things. And it was sort of like, okay, I'm not in a place where I can make work and the rest of the world isn't in a place where they're working anyways. Um, yeah, and then Riley reached out and asked me if I wanted to do something with him or just go to the studio and um, I had nothing going on. So I just went and didn't really have any expectations for what was gonna happen. Um, and then he was struggling. He was having a dealing with some of his own, you know, personal things. And we were in the studio, and um, we put on the score, the score that Mark had made not long before he passed away. It's um, it's a sort of like a mix that he had made that he had sent to me. And I don't know. It was sort of like this unspoken thing almost, where like we had this music on, and we were in the studio, and I. I feel like we both knew we were going to make a piece at that point and we didn't know it was going to look anything like what it looks like right now or that it was we were going to be in this place that we are now but um you just knew there was this motivating story yeah, yeah yeah and like and for me there was like a reason to make work again mm -hmm. um and there was a reason to yeah it was a reminder of like the importance of collaboration and um of how that's something that's been really, you know, special to me. It was really special to my relationship with Mark and the way that I worked with him. And Riley also knew him and worked with him. And so it feels, um, it feels right and it feels like safe to be working on this process with him. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about how um, those kind of narrative. Um, devices that you're kind of thinking through and working through on different levels in your life, like how those take form in the piece? Like what is the structure of the piece? What does it look like? Um, and how is that kind of formal aspect informed by this more narrative aspect? Yeah, a big, for in um, the work that I've been doing, a big theme that I've been working with is this idea of like an aftermath or like what it's like to exist in an aftermath and sort of the, 
um, like kind of like dizzying effects of like what it's like uh, like when you're in sort of that state of like shock of like something that's that's happened um and so i've been with the dancers that i've been working with we've been exploring um yeah ideas surrounding aftermath ideas surrounding sort of like waking up and being somewhere which is where you didn't expect to land yeah. and um yeah what it's like to live in that place and similar to the kind of practice stuff that we were talking about like what it's like to live in that space without the expectation that you have to do anything with it or um, that it's going to look like what you think it's going to look like because um, in a really real way like this work that I'm making now is work that you know I never thought I would have to make because I never thought I would have to make something without my creative partner actually here and so um, yeah we've been sort of just using like those ways of thinking as ways to approach um, crafting movement and improvisation and yeah so the piece is in several stages there's um the piece that you choreographed mm -hmm. and then there's riley's piece afterwards before before, before. Yeah. okay yeah. see i don't know yeah. um, <laughs> i will soon yeah. um so uh, I think that's really interesting, too, to think about it being broken up into these sections that are, again, distinct but interconnected and um, kind of structurally driven by the narrative. And I, I also just love how you're kind of thinking about work itself as the conduit from mm -hmm. a dark place to a lighter place. Um, have you seen Uncle Vanya? No. The play. It's no. such a, it's a, it's so wonderful. And the last scene of Uncle Vanya has these two like you know, these two characters who are these like totally difficult people who are impossible to get along with, but they're both completely heartbroken and um they're just together alone and um they've been dismissed by, you know, everyone else who's left and uh they talk and they come to the realization that only through work can you address the ramifications of having your heart broken and through that work you find a portal to transcendence um, and it's just so beautiful to think about work itself which has you know just the idea of work doesn't necessarily hold the promise of you know blooming into another into another realm or inhabiting a different place but it really does. And the kind yeah, of work does, that you're describing, yeah. I love how it's, you know, it's really, you know, uh, taking that idea very seriously. Yeah, yeah, that really resonates. Yeah, we, um, Heather, a couple of years ago, actually, the first kind of thing that we did like this together, she, she had a residency at the Boston Center for the Arts when she was living there. <clears throat> and she invited me to show, to dance, um, actually in a very similar format, kind of what we're doing. Like she, she had been working on one piece of her, with her dancer as a trio, and then I came and did a solo before that. And we just sort of combined into one evening, um, but we hadn't been working together on it so, somehow, but we were sharing like a, a show. So, and so this, the format of this show that we're doing for Our Wolf is a little bit similar, or you know, Heather has the work that she's made with her six dancers um, to the piece of music that Mark made. And, um, and that's sort of the second half of the show, and then the beginning is a duet that I'm choreographing uh, for the two of us. Um, um, actually, very much about the transition between light and dark. Um, absolutely, yeah. It's it's the it, it's the you know I'm a fairly extreme person, and I've lived a pretty extreme life of of a lot of a lot of travel and a lot of movement, and almost too much in a way that's really affected you know my my shape of mental health i was diagnosed bipolar last year uh, right before heather and i got into that studio so that's what i was coming in with and then needing to understand like how much my mental states was inter is intertwined with the work that i make and they're not separate again because like your body's not your, your mind isn't separate from your body you know it's the same it's the same thing you know so, you know, I was going from like very, very extreme highs of like all these ideas and just go, go, go and traveling to this country, that country, just almost constantly. And then I, my version of the pandemic also was that I, it was the first year and I think 15 years that I got to actually just be in one place, in one state, yeah, in right. one time zone yeah. so for an entire year. I literally yeah. never had that since I graduated college. And so this, you know, my, my, my piece is called Temperance. Um, and it's it's very much about our relationship, knowing that how, how much Heather has or is teaching me how to be grounded and, and temper myself from from those very high places, yeah. and then also knowing like how to how to move move through the very dark places that I go with my own depression, which is which is 
um, immobilizing. Right. Absolute depression is absolutely immobilizing, and it's it's and it's made worse by isolation, right. and it's and it's cured or not cured, but it's 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 helped through connection, yeah. through being with people, and then having you know, being there for each other to help, you know, lift up and, and just be, be in those places that you are, you know, but you're not alone. Absolutely. Well, and that's interesting too. That leads to another question I have. Um, I'd really like to hear about how um, your work connects to the idea of mental health and neurodiversity um, and how you find in your choreographic and dance practices and also in outreach to the community, how you find a place um, to talk about mental health, to address it, um, and you know, to kind of work through some of the many layers associated with that big concept. Yeah, I think something that's been really special about the connection that I have with Riley is that because we have an understanding of what it's like to um, to struggle with mental health, what it's like to struggle with um, to struggle with depression, is that we're able to be so honest with each other and we're in a place where like if one of us is really struggling or if one of us needs support in a different way where we're able to um, offer it to each other and that we're I think working together to acknowledge how um, important it is to be attuned to what's happening and to like what's going on um, with our mental health alongside of the process and allowing for that to like in, to some extent inform like how much and when we're working on things and that um that makes sense yeah yeah you know i mean we're we're making we're making dance like that's what mm -hmm. that's what we're doing and um if it, if we're in a place where like like riley knows that january is not a time for him to travel and perform then then let's just not let's just not do it then and let's mm -hmm. find let's do it in, at a different time and in a different place um following yeah. this and, and like yeah. you know it, it's like there's this way of like you know you're you're very aware of what what's happening for, to to the self you know, mm -hmm. the inside of you but then you also what's helpful to me i think or what's helpful i think to us is like to scale out, to scope out and see that you're part of a bigger cycle, a bigger system. And I know, I know now because of that diagnosis that I, I, I can predict how and when and why I'm going to be elevated or I'm going to be really low. Right. And that it's, so, some of it is definitely due to just how my mind works, my brain works, but it's, it's also about the seasons and the time zones and, mm -hmm. and, and the things that I can't control that I'm I'm going to be a part of whether or not I want to. Right. Um, and and I find that a, a very comforting thing because it, it means that it, it it just helps me be in the moment and, be, and not feel so much like I ha there's something in me that I have to fix that I have to in, you know in, right. intrinsically change about who exactly. I am. Exactly. Right. You know? And but I feel like yeah. also that kind of cyclical responsiveness that you're talking about. Um, it kind of goes back to this place of, um, you know, one's mental state um, is, you know, it's what you inhabit and it's how you approach the world and it's not necessarily something that has to change to adhere to a normative standard, right? right. Mm -hmm. And there can be severe challenges that come with, you know, whatever it is that we bring to the world and what we've been handed, but there's also like beautiful, positive, like productive things that come from it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely will, I definitely can say that um, a lot of the work that I make in pretty much all of the forms, all, all the art that I make, a, a, a lot of it is made, I don't know, maybe all of it, maybe most of it, is made from, from hypomania. You know, hypomania is, you know, an elevated, an elevated mood, an elevated state of mind where like, in my experience, you feel like it's just this like constant stream of ideas and inspiration, and you start to see, you know see connections everywhere, and like oh if I do that, and it almost feels like I can I can, I can see in the future a little bit, or it feels almost mystical in a lot of ways. Um, it, so it's a, but it's a flame you have to take care of because if you don't, and I've had this many many times where like I it, it's 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 pulling me along, and then the flame gets too bright, and then I get burned. Um, but yet you have access to this thing to tap into that you now, if you can't control it, you can at least kind of know that it's there. Right. And you can allow it to, to work with you, right? right? And yeah. like, you know, how, what Heather was saying about January, like that's, I've tried for many years, like I had just really hard winters. And, and at some point I was like, why am I still trying to work in, <laughs> why am I still trying to travel and work in January? Like, I just need to be at home in South Portland and my, with my cat and my, my couch <laughs> and everything. And then, you know, that's what I need right now, you know? Um, 
uh, and then knowing that if, if I give myself to just be that, be in that state of mind for that period of time, um, and, and, and be in the moment of it, like, it does change, you know? The way that right. you feel now yeah. is not how you're gonna feel later. Um, but instead of trying to, like, force it or feel like, oh, I should be more productive, I should be making art, like, just, just give yourself some time. Like, there's, there's, time, there's time to work with somehow. Right. Um, you know, I made Portland Dance Month a couple of years ago, too, where it was like this massive decentralized dance festival here in Portland that was like really just like, look at how much dance is happening in Portland. And that was also born completely out of hypomania. I didn't realize that that was happening to me. Um, but it feels good, you know. It, it also feels, you know, if, if, you, if you, you know, control it, if you give, give it the, the healthy space it needs, you can be incredibly creative and incredibly productive. And I know that I'm not the only artist who works that way. I think it's or the only, only, you know, not even artists, just everybody. I think there's a lot of people who, who sort of have those cycles. And what a, I think we're lucky right now that we are, we're in an era that we can talk about these things. Because yeah. this is not a new thing for me to go through, to live through, live with. There's no cure for it. It's just who I am. But like, I didn't know at 16 when I was depressed and it was I, I, the world just seemed so dark. Or I didn't know that the crash that I had after college the first time I performed a work of William Forsyth that was like just lasted weeks, that that, that was something I could talk about or pay attention to. Yeah. And so we, we both feel like, how can we talk about our work if we're not talking about those things? They're so intimately intertwined, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, that's been a really big shift for me. Um, before, yeah, before Mark, had died, I had n really not spoken openly about the things that I was struggling with or um, about the ways that my depression was affecting me and um, even was like really scared to talk about it in the context of my work because I was afraid of what people would think if I yeah. was honest about the fact that I was, um, that my work was a way for me to look at these things and to like look at parts of myself that um, were dark. Yeah, that there was there wasn't another way to look at them. Um, and I, I I feel so grateful that I have this partnership now with somebody where um, we're able to talk about those things because I think when I was working with Mark, we did talk about them, but we talked about them in like a very like abstract kind of way where those yeah. things were in the room, but they weren't necessarily um, acknowledged outright in the way that Riley and I are practicing right now. And um, yeah, that's been a huge shift for me. It's one that I still feel um, uncomfortable in yeah. a lot of the time. <laughs> like I'm still yeah. like, yeah. I'm still getting used to it. But um, yeah, totally. I know from conversations that I've been having with some of my other collaborators and people that I've worked with that it's actually really helpful for them and to, to hear these things. And so I think, um, yeah. Yeah, it feels like it's worth it to both of it us. And, yeah. and every time that I've been open about what my mental cycles are like, people are receptive. I mean, it is, it's an uncomfortable conversation, I think, a lot, in a lot of ways because they don't really know what it is and it might, you know, remind them of something that's uncomfortable in their mind. Right, but yeah. I, I think the word uncomfortable is really important. I think, I think things that feel uncomfortable are worth paying attention to yeah. Yeah, because they're unfamiliar. And I think in that moment, in that, in that way, um, there's an opportunity for learning. Um, learning is not comfortable. Learning right. takes work. It takes it brings Absolutely. calories. Like you know, yeah. and, you know, and it's 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 worth. It. Otherwise, you know, you're just sort of staying on the same path that you're always on. But if you like, if, if you do the work to to hack a new path for yourself into the woods, like you know, you, you you'll discover something that is very much there that you just weren't paying attention to before. Mm -hmm. And to do that yeah. together is like is just so much more fun yeah and what you're doing together too is you're building something from it you're not just yeah. unearthing it and observing it and moving on but you're you know putting you're rechanneling that work like um you know the end of uncle vanya sort of points you toward right it's like it's like in there is the power to you know shift yourself into like a dimension of um you know like really seeing clearly and really like allowing that message to be broadcast to other people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wish that someone had talked about this when I was 20. Yeah. You know, oh, I really God, wish yeah. that I had heard yeah. this or that it wasn't something that you like, we've got to be quiet about that. Like, why? Why? I'm still doing the same work. I'm still, right. I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, you know, I'm still doing things. Well, I also feel like socially there's so much more recognition of neurodiversity as like um, just another way for the world to be flexible and expansive and not necessarily 
to inhabit a problem that has to be corrected, but to inhabit a difference that can be, you know, illuminating mm -hmm. and productive. Yeah, life is complex. So, yeah. Everybody has a different biography. Everyone has a different mm -hmm. way of thinking and like yeah. allowing the complexity to be, to be there of like, this is how you think, how you work, how I work, like, and then we're together and we're maybe making something, the work that's gonna be made, it's gonna also inhabit that complexity, right. which is infinitely more interesting than like, let's all be in unison and only, <laughs> let's all be the, pretend we're the same people, which like, why, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thought experiment, yeah. maybe. Right, right, right. Um, so, you know, I think um, one of the really interesting things for me about the work that you're doing too is how kind of place-based it seems. It's really anchored in spaces, it's responsive to spaces, um, and, I think the Mechanics Hall itself is such an incredible space to kind of respond to and anchor oneself in, um, in a constructive way. Um, and I would love to know a little bit more about kind of the community aspect of your work at the Mechanics Hall and with Portland Ovations. Um, and how does this particular example of community involvement or engagement, how does it take form right now for you? And how does it relate back to a, like a wider dance community in this region? Yeah. <laughs> um, we, uh, yeah, again, dance is a social art. It happens because people are together and, and making it happen. Um, I, uh, Ovations, you know, offered this commission and we were thinking, we were looking for places to be in Portland to do this. And uh, I, this is, we're, we're, we're in Mechanics Hall right now. Um, it's on Congress Street. It's right across from Mecca. It's, it's a really historical building uh, in Portland. It's one of the oldest buildings in the city. Um, I, 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 love, I love spaces that have history to them. I love spaces that have had a lot of life in them. I'm, I'm less interested in like a brand new building with a you know, state of the art technology. That's good too, but you know, there's, there's a different feeling. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if it's in a brand new space that nobody's lived in before, um, which is interesting too, but in this way, like we, we really wanted to be in a space that has a long history of it. Um, you know, we've got these paintings that there, there was a, in the early 1900s, there was a, a dance teacher here who had his little academy. Um, where he was making, um, you know, um, I think it's called the, the Harvard Dip. I, I can't remember his <laughs> name. I should, I should know his name at this point. But, um, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of stuff that's happened in this room. And so um, we're just sort of contributing to that by being in the room now. Yeah. Um, and it's so beautiful. And, and, and the Mechanics Hall as an organization has been so supportive and so excited about, you know, bringing something like this in the space. Yeah that yes, it's about the beauty of the space, yes, it's the history of it, but it's also the people that we want to work with um, and, and knowing that the choreographic ideas that we may have as artists um, are not enough by themselves. It takes a community to make, it takes a whole team of people to make dance happen, you know, for Portland. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a wonderful learning curve, I think, for all of us. I don't think through, you know, with Portland Ovations and then Mechanics Hall and with us, like all of us are sort of new to, uh, to do this together. I think Ovations hasn't commissioned work in this way so much and the Mechanics Hall hasn't had this type of performance on the scale before. And, you know, we're just forming our company now. This is new for us. And so all of us as a, as a community are figuring out how this works and how to communicate to each other and how to do the emails and how to you know how to plan things ahead well and there's a lot of trust there right yeah mm -hmm. to have the commission come from portland ovations is like such an act of faith and you know yeah, yeah. Totally. um you know just like allowing the creative process to have weight right yeah right. and yeah yeah and yeah we were something we were talking about this morning was that um like if it was just Riley and I, it would just be us in a studio, like talking about these things and like rolling around and yeah. like just, you know, uh, being together in a space. But through, yeah, it's like really through the um, generosity of these partnerships with Ovations and with Mechanics Hall that- um, And Casco Bay Movers. And ca yeah, yeah. yeah. Casco Bay Movers where we rehearse and who are also so supportive of us and the work that we've been doing. It's really through those partnerships that, um, this performance is possible and that we're yeah we're able to create a work and then not only like create it but to be able to produce it and to share it and um, to bring other artists in from out of town to work on it with us and yeah and you know three of the yeah. dancers have moved or are moving here to join us so that this you know we're able to facilitate new dancers to to move to Portland to be and the, you know to work with us but then they're going to have their own teaching and they're going to make their own work maybe and they're going to make yeah, their connections right. so i like to think about the big picture of things a lot and and 
yes, it's about our show and where we want to be and who we want to work with, but knowing that um, you know, when you do something like this, it doesn't just end at the last show. Right. Like there are yeah. new connections that you make. The people will meet each other, audiences will meet each other, our dancers are meeting other people from the community and, 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 our, and our company practices. Um, and we, we just love Portland. We love Maine. I'm from Maine originally and I've spent so much time in other places in the world and I, you know, a couple of years ago I needed to feel like I was home somewhere and I realized like actually I'm not going to feel home anywhere unless it's Maine. Um, and, and I've had the, all, those, all those experiences professionally and artistically um, and I've been very privileged in that way and it's really important to me to open the door for other people as well and right now the best way to do that is for us to form this company. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's just a joy. It's just, it's, it's you know, really doing it. It's and really fantastic for me too, as someone who's not, you know, immersed in the practice of dance, but is very, very interested in it, um, you know, as an art form, just intellectually. Um, just to go back to the idea of observation and what that kind of lets in creatively, you're also, you know, offering the experience of that observation to people who would watch the performances. Um, yeah. Which I find to be so powerful, you know. I mean, I know it's a, you know, obviously like the foundation of performance based art is the fact that it's generative in that way. People watch it and people observe it. But I don't know. It's, if you think about it more as a kind of like, you know, creative responsiveness, it gets really interesting. Yeah, totally. And I think, especially in, um, Portland or in Maine in general, there's you know there's been some really great dance artists and organizations over the last few years who have been doing um, really great work that actually you know was part of the reason that I ended up moving here was because I came up here for a couple of different things that were happening and then you know got to know Riley and looked around and really liked really liked the community here um, that. You know, we've both lived in bigger cities and we've sort of experienced what it's like to be in like a really saturated dance city where there's a lot of performances happening, you know, like a whole bunch of performances happening every single week. Um, and that's not the case here. So I think there is something really special about being able to build a company like this in, in a place where, um, yeah, there, there, is, there has been some great dance happening, but um, it ha certainly hasn't been happening on... Um, the same consistent basis that you would get in a in a larger city, and then also like you know the about the work that I'm making specifically too. I mentioned about like you know the, wanting to use the age of a space, the age of mechanics. Yeah. <clears throat> like, so I'm using music for my piece that I made um, at Hugh and Oaks a couple of years ago, and at the Ellis Beauregard a couple of years ago Foundation, and you know she we brought her to Space Gallery to perform and. Um, you know, Sarah Julie and Asher Woodworth were using a lot, doing a lot of, you know, programming things. So it's like, even if it's a small thing, like we just brought her for that one show at Space. Yeah, now I'm here. And now she's <laughs> moved here and, and yeah. is forming a dance company. So like, it's yeah. paying attention to those little moments and those little connections, mm -hmm. or that one piece of music that I made just by myself in that house at, in, at Hugh and Oaks. Yeah. Like, they're as much a part of, of what we're going to show, you know, that are as much as what we're making in the last month. You know, as as other you know, as uh, is it, <laughs> as it is otherwise. Um, so I love the idea that you know, using time in a in a in a more deep way is is contributing to to what you see in the moment in the performance. It's just being collected into the moment that you're watching it. So um, could you tell us when the when the performances will be, mm -hmm. and how to access the tickets? Yeah, um, so the performances take place in here, yeah, Maine Mechanics Hall Ballroom, and um, they're going to be May 18, 19, 20, and... 7.30. 7.30. Um, and on the, after the first show, there's going to be a little premiere party, and after the last show, there's going to be an artist talk back, so if people are interested in hearing more about the work, um, oh, that's the, the Friday night show is when we're doing our artist talk back. And we've also, we're opening our company practice to the public at Casco Bay Movers on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 10.15 to 11.45 um, for, you know, our company to train and, you know, stay, stay in practice, um, but also to meet new people and new artists who want to, who wanna, you know, work on their craft as a dancer. Um, so we're hoping that's a place for people to, you know, the community to come. Um, we're also, you know, we sort of taken a bunch of choreographic elements for this piece that we're you know, we've got our two dances, we've got our music and stuff. 
this is also a piece that's going to be available to be extracted and recontextualized in different ways. So here it's called Our Wolf on the Lighthouse. Um, and then in June, June 3 and 4, we're going to San Francisco to the State of Play Festival at ODC Theater. Um, and there will be Our Wolf in the Cavern. So we're basically taking a lot of the same elements and just reimagining it into a space that is not a ballroom, but a theater, and then sort of reworking it that way. So we very much work sort of um, in iterations yeah. in that way. Fantastic. Yes. And um, all of the information, you can go either on our website, littlehousedance.com, or um, on Instagram, or if you go on Portland Ovations, you can um, find links for tickets and, and info. So through Portland Ovations, I can get tickets to the performances? Yes. Yeah, I think it's important. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs>